My name is Hannah and this is my no buy year. So I'm calling this video my no buy year by the numbers and I thought of the idea for this video a couple of months ago. I've been planning to do it for the past couple of months and I've been excited about it because I think it's pretty interesting information and it was interesting to kind of calculate it all out, add it all up. But what I really, really wish is that I had thought about this video at the beginning of the year so that I could have kept track of all the numbers in a more precise way from the beginning and so that I could be absolutely sure of all of the numbers. But I didn't really think to do that. I didn't really plan very well for what my channel would be like at the end of the year and what I would want to do at the end of the year because I started my YouTube channel and my know by year at the same time. So I didn't know that it was going to grow this much, the channel I mean, and I didn't really have a sense of how invested I would be in it at this point and how much I would wish that I had kept more careful track of the actual nitty gritty of how the no buy year unfolded in terms of money, numbers of products, amount of stuff, etc. I didn't even have the presence of mind to take a picture of my vanity at the beginning of the year so that I could show you guys a before and after of what was a very cluttered and overstuffed space in my house and what is now a relatively organized and not at all overstuffed space in my house. I also really wish I had taken a picture of my bathroom shelving before the beginning of the year because there's been an incredibly dramatic change. I used to be taking up like two shelves and one of them had this basket that was overflowing with bath and body stuff and now I'm down to taking up like half of one little shelf in the bathroom and everything's pretty clear and organized and it, it doesn't feel so overflowing and claustrophobic anymore. It just, it feels very tidy and lovely and pleasant. And a lot of spaces in my house have changed in that way. And I did try to track down some of the numbers that explain those changes. But all I'm trying to say is that taking these numbers down, trying to track them down and collect them retroactively was not an exact science, but I did do my very best. And even though I, as many of you already know, am truly terrible at math, I double and triple checked the numbers. I used the calculator on my phone and I feel pretty confident that even though I don't think any of these numbers are probably exact down to the one, some of them may be, but even if they aren't, all of them are at least in the ballpark of the reality. So we can get a pretty clear sense of the general shape of the way that the numbers of my no buy year have shaken down. And I was able to come to some pretty interesting numerical conclusions. So let's go ahead and get into the meat of the video. So the first thing I did when I sat down to make this list was to go back through all of my empties videos and add up all of my empties. And the grand total of the number of empties that I showed on screen during my know by year is 242. I also went through my declutter videos and I added up the number of items that I decluttered on camera. And I pretty much decluttered everything on camera and showed all my empties on camera. There might have been a couple here and there that I missed, but adding those two totals together, my total number of shed items during my no buy year is 319 things. So there are 319 objects, <laughs> beauty objects pretty much, in my house at the beginning of the year that are now gone either because I decluttered them or because I used them up. Then I went and counted the number of makeup items that are actually left. I counted up every single piece of makeup that I currently own and the total of those items is 212. So I have 212 individual pieces of makeup in my collection. I counted palettes as one thing. 212. The number of skincare items left in my collection is 37. That's more than I would like it to be. I'm still working on whittling that down, but that's what it currently is. That includes literally every item, like every little deluxe sample size of a mask that I'm still trying to get through, every single thing, it adds up to 37. Although I counted all my sheet masks as one, I believe. 
The number of bath and body products left in my collection is only three. I have used up all of the body washes that I had during the No By Year, all of the body soaps with which I entered the year, and I repurchased one thing into that category, which was a big, the biggest size of a lush body wash. So I have that body wash, and then I have two bottles of lotion with which I started the year, both of which are almost finished, and I'm trying to get through those. So I only have three, and that was a pretty bloated category at the beginning of the year. That was really interesting to add those up, and that's how I like it. I'm really glad that I only have one body soap, and I would like it to stay that way. I'm going to use up this bottle, and then I'll buy another one. The number of hair products that I currently have, though, is much bigger. It's 20. I counted every single little spray bottle, spritz, sea salt, random tube of stuff that I have, and I have 20 things, so that's kind of a lot. I have been receiving some, for some reason a lot of people have given me hair products during the course of the year, so I do have kind of maybe more hair products than I would have if I hadn't been receiving gifts this year, but for whatever reason, for a plethora of reasons, I have 20 things in the hair category. So the total number of beauty products that are currently in my house that I currently own, makeup, skincare, hair care, and bath and body stuff, it all adds up to 272 individual items. So over the course of the No By Year, I shed 319 individual beauty items and I kept 272. So the total, all of those items would be 591, which means that my current collection of 272 things is 46% of what the total would be if I had, for some reason, kept all of those items during the course of this year. It's a little bit hard to extrapolate what would have happened if I hadn't been on a no-buy year and if I hadn't been on YouTube. So I did receive some of those things as gifts, and some of those gifts came into my life because I'm on YouTube, so that skews the numbers a little bit. Also, if I hadn't been on a no-buy year, I probably still would have finished up some of the things that I finished up, but I don't think I would have had nearly as many empties. I don't think I would have even come close to having 242 empties in 2018 if I hadn't been on a no-buy year, because the main reason that I had so many empties was that I was forcing myself to use what I had instead of buying new and exciting things that I would have used in lieu of like the dregs of all of my old stuff. So if I hadn't been on a no buy, most of the things that were in my empties would still be here. They would still be right here in front of me, half empty, and I would probably also have bought things. So I would have added stuff. So for all of those reasons, it's hard to calculate the exact number, but I think that it's safe to say, very safe to say, that the number of beauty products in my house has shrunk by over 50% of what it was at the beginning of my no-buy year. Over 50% of what it was, and well over 50% of what it would have been if I hadn't been on a no-buy. I wasn't able to calculate the worth of all of my empties. This is a question that I've gotten a couple of times over the past month, and it's simply because, I mean, I, I was technically able, I could have done it, um, but I chose not to do it because looking up the exact price of all 272 products that were in my empties and then adding up all of those numbers together would have honestly taken hours, and it's hours that I don't have during this incredibly busy holiday season. But we can have some fun extrapolating. We can have some fun guessing. Let's say that the average was $10, like the average empty was worth $10. If that had been true, then I would have gone through $2,420 worth of stuff during my no-buy year. So some of my empties were minis and deluxe sample sizes, and some of them were even little sample packets, but overall, the ones that weren't were worth way, way more than $10. My stuff, my skincare tends to be much more expensive than that. So I think that $10 as an average is probably a pretty conservative estimate. So if we were to double that and say that the average empty was worth $20, and that means that I would have gone through $4,840 worth of stuff during my no-buy year. And honestly, knowing myself and knowing my skincare, and knowing kind of the ratio between minis and deluxe samples and full-size products that 
was in my empties over the course of the year. My guess is that it's it's actually more than that. But I feel like just looking at what it would have been if it was $10 an item and looking at what it would have been if it was $20 an item is quite enough for me. I'm ready to stop there. I don't have to know the exact number to know that whatever it is, it's staggering. So let's talk about money. And I think my video about what I would have bought during my no buy year and these numbers that I can be absolutely sure I saved based on those items, I think that that video should have already gone up. And I actually think that my skincare video will have already gone up as well. So some of this is rehashing information from those videos and kind of putting it in context with itself. Oh, actually, this is new information for you guys. The amount spent on replacements. This is the total amount spent on replacements. So I looked at my total spend at Sephora, and then I subtracted what I had spent on gifts for other people at Sephora. But then I actually went through all of my other purchases. I went through my inbox. I went through my Amazon order history. I hope I got everything, but I calculated that the total amount that I spent just replacing my staple items within the confines of my rules during the no buy year was $1,135. And what's really interesting about this is that the vast majority of that amount of money was spent during the first half of the year. Because when I filmed my video about how I had already made VIB Rouge, I had spent, I think, around $700 or $750 on myself at Sephora, and then the rest of the way to the $1,000 that you have to spend to make rouge had been spent on other people. So I know that at the very least, by halfway through the year when I filmed that video, I had spent around $700. And then I also know that I had placed a bunch of Amazon orders. I had replaced other things that didn't come from Sephora at that moment during the course of the year as well. So I'm guessing that at the very least $800, if not closer to $900 of my replacements spend had already been spent at halfway through the year. And what that means if you look at my total spent on replacements over the course of the whole year was that I went on during the second half of the no buy year to only spend 250 maybe $300 on replacements. So my behavior changed dramatically in terms of what I was willing to spend on my replacement items. So I'm throwing in a number from a different video, which was the one where I looked at all the makeup that I would have purchased. The minimum amount that I know I would have spent on extraneous makeup items over the course of the year was $866. The amount that I would have spent on skincare, that's also coming from another video, from the video about skincare. And in that video, I calculated what my skincare routine was worth per year at the beginning of the no buy year. If I had continued on with that extremely expensive skincare routine, I would have spent an estimate of $2,634 on skincare during the year of 2018. And if you look at the roughly $900 that I had spent by halfway through the year, you can see that I was actually kind of on track to do that. So the numbers do make sense with each other. So if you add all of that up, the total minimum amount I'm sure I would have spent on beauty, and I say minimum amount because I'm sure that there are things that I didn't know that I would have bought if I hadn't been on a no-buy, but the total minimum amount that I'm absolutely sure I would have spent is $3,500. And if you subtract what I did spend from that, that means that the absolute minimum amount I can confidently say that I saved just on beauty products over the course of the year is $2,365. So also in that video about what I would have bought, I ran through a quick list of things off the top of my head that I remember wishing that I could buy over the course of the year and that I feel pretty much confident that I would have purchased during 2019 if I hadn't been on a no-buy, things other than beauty. So the minimum amount I'm sure I would have spent in other categories besides beauty, namely clothing and homewares, is $1,540. So if you add that to the amount that I'm sure I would have spent on beauty, that means that the total that I would have spent on all categories, at the very least, is $5,040. Now, I didn't spend any money on other stuff. I didn't have a replacements provision for clothing or homewares. So 
the total amount that I spent on clothing during my no buy year is zero dollars and the total amount that I spent on um, homewares is also zero dollars. So if you subtract the total that I actually did spend this year on beauty from the five thousand and forty dollars that I would have spent altogether then the minimum total of what I saved on all stuff, all categories because of the no buy is $3,905. So almost $4,000 saved for sure. So those are all the numbers that I calculated and recorded and sussed out in regards to all of the stuff that I bought and didn't buy and all of the stuff that I'm sure I would have bought and the number of things that I had in my house and that I kicked out of my house and that I used up during the course of the no buy year. Again, it's not an exact science and again I want to say that um, unfortunately and humiliatingly I feel like I'm being quite conservative with these calculations and at every turn if I had a chance to overestimate or underestimate how many things I had or how much money I would have spent or all of that stuff, I always underestimated because I want to make sure that what I'm reporting is something I can be sure is true, but I'm equally sure that those numbers, the reality of those numbers and the reality of what they would have been in a different year are all higher. It's it's all higher than what I'm actually saying. So, so I think I can be sure and feel glad that I saved a minimum of $4,000 this year on stuff, but um, I'm also aware that um, I'm, I actually saved more than that, and even more importantly than that perhaps, I saved myself from credit card debt. Because as I said in my video about skincare, I don't have $4,000 right now. I didn't make a lot of money this year. We have a small business that we just moved to a big city, and I don't have much spending money. So where would those $4,000 have come from? It wouldn't. It would have it would be debt. I would be that far in debt right now and I would have $4,000 worth of stuff that I couldn't afford to buy in my little apartment right now surrounding me. I absolutely would. Wow, I never thought about it that way until just now. No buy year for the win. So for the last part of this video, I thought I would do something that I actually don't see very often if ever on YouTube which is to share with you the numbers the behind the scenes numbers of my YouTube channel over the course of this year. This was my first year on YouTube and I was able to monetize my channel about halfway through the year. You can monetize your channel I think when you have 1,000 subscribers or more and I think it's something like 4,000 watch hours and when I got to that point I monetized my channel and I started making AdSense revenue. Now it is extremely difficult if not impossible to predict or track or even to understand AdSense revenue and how it works and that's because Advertisers pay to put their ad in front of a video and they basically vie for position. It's kind of like an auction system. So for example, when I have looked into the behind the scenes, the back end of my YouTube channel, I've looked at individual videos and looked at how much those individual videos have made in AdSense revenue. And even though AdSense is related to views, so YouTubers get paid according to how many views each video gets. It has nothing to do with subscribers, it's all about the views. So even though that's true, I have some videos that have more views than other videos, but have made less money in terms of AdSense, even though they were posted on my channel around the same time. And that's because for some reason, advertisers are willing to pay more for that second video. So for some reason, I made more per click on that video than I did on the first video, even though the first one got more views. And I have no idea what those factors are. I don't understand the algorithm. I don't understand what advertisers do and don't want to pay for. It also has something to do with time of year, what day of the week it is, maybe what time of day it is. I don't know. There's all of this mystery surrounding how the money comes through on YouTube. And for that reason, it's really difficult to sort of talk about how much a YouTuber in my situation is making and why. But I'm going to do my best to break down some of the numbers for you and to kind of give you a general picture of what it is like to start a YouTube channel that 
goes relatively well or that grows at the rate that mine grew this year and what that actually looks like in terms of hours of work and what that actually looks like in terms of investment and pay. Just warning you, it's a little grim, but it will be looking up in 2019 for me. So before I start, this is definitely not how it is for all YouTubers during their first year. Some YouTubers do spectacularly better than I did, some don't do as well, and there are so many factors, there are so many variables that it's really hard to know. It, it, don't take what I'm about to say and apply it to other people because it just doesn't work that way. You can't say, oh, Hannah's made X amount and therefore Jacqueline Hill probably makes X amount. It, it's much more complicated than that. I'm just telling you about my channel and my experience. So I started my channel halfway through January and I've gone for the whole year. I was monetized about halfway through the year and I committed to posting two videos a week. I posted consistently. I also often posted a third video, especially during the second half of the year. So I posted more than two videos per week. The total number of YouTube videos that I will have posted by the time this video goes live will be 133. Now I'm saying that the average number of hours that I work on each video is five. It takes me some time to get ready and to get everything together. I rarely end up with less than an hour of footage. <laughs> this is just the sad truth. For a 20 minute video, if I'm ever able to edit it down that short, I've almost always filmed for over an hour. And that is pretty unique to me. A lot of YouTubers don't film for that long. I'm a talker. I'm very careful about the language that I use. I am very thorough and I tend to kind of over film and make sure that I have all of the footage that I want to make the video that I'm trying to make. If I film for an hour, that means that my first pass at editing is at the very least an hour because I have to watch all of that footage, but it's longer than an hour because it takes time to kind of cut and paste and chop and do all of the work that you have to do. So if I film for an hour, then I'm probably taking my first pass through all of that footage for about an hour and a half, if not an hour and 45 minutes or two hours. Then I always take a second pass through my footage and that pass will be longer than whatever the length of the video is. So my videos tend to average out around a half hour. I would say that second pass is probably gonna be 45 minutes to an hour. And then I have to do all of the post work. So after I upload, I'm going through and putting in all of the links for all of the things that I talk about in the video, putting in the end cards, the end screens, putting in the cards. Often I watch the video again one or two times through in order to add in all of that information accurately. So five hours per video is actually a pretty conservative estimate. And as you know, I frequently have videos that are a lot longer than 20 minutes. My empties videos, for example, Many of them had two hours of footage when I sat down to edit. My hair videos, that was like four hours of footage. So if it's five hours per video, then the total number of hours that I spent working on my videos this year is 665 hours. Then I had to calculate out my time spent on comments. And at this point, I'm still answering all my comments. And I'm going to talk about this at the beginning of next year, but I'm afraid that that policy is going to have to change soon because I spend more than an hour a day answering comments and with my life and with my ambitions, it's getting to be too much. I will still read all of the comments and I will still respond to a lot of them, but um, I think I'm going to have to change my policy in 2019. But for now, I'm, I'm seeing it out. I'm going to see you guys through to the end of the year. I'm going to make sure that I respond to every comment through to the end of the year. And at this point, I'm, I'm spending maybe an hour and a half every morning. On comments but that has obviously grown over the course of the year I wasn't spending an hour and a half in January February March it got to be about an hour around the middle of the year and then it has kind of incrementally increased since then so this is one of the most guessy of all guesses but I'm kind of guessing that the average number of hours spent on comments per day if you average it out over the whole year is one one hour per day. Um, and so I'm putting it out there that I've spent about 350 hours responding to comments and doing other kinds of like maintenance stuff on my YouTube channel over the course of this year. So if you add that all together, the rough total of the amount of time that I've spent working on the channel, creating content and responding to comments is 1,015 
hours in 2018. My total AdSense revenue, which I just looked up, you can look at your lifetime total of AdSense revenue. At this point in the year, and today is, I'm actually filming this before I'm posting this video. So today is December 17th, and my total AdSense revenue is $1,468, which is a lot of money. It's way more than I expected it to be at this moment in the year. I had no idea that it would add up like this, and AdSense does go up over the holidays because advertisers are paying more to advertise on YouTube videos during the holidays, so there's been a little bit of a boost in that over the last, yeah, like, month. It's just gotten higher than I expected it to be at this point. However, as much as $1,468 seems to be for a little YouTuber in her first year on YouTube, if you apply that number to the 1,015 hours that I worked over the course of the year to make that money, then my hourly wage for work on YouTube this year has been $1.44 an hour. Now, of course, for the first half of the year, my channel wasn't monetized and I was working for, for free, for nothing. And in the second half of the year, I started out making much, much, much less than that per hour. And then my hourly wage, just technically in terms of when and how I'm getting paid, has grown over the course of the second half of the year. So it hasn't been $1.44 an hour since the beginning. But if you're looking at the year as a single unit of work, and you're looking at my year on YouTube and my income on YouTube, that is about the measure of, of things. However, <laughs> we have not yet taken into account the startup costs for the channel, the amount of money that we had to invest for me to even be able to get on here and start doing this in the first place. So the total startup cost of the channel, and I bought a ring light, I bought a camera, and then I bought all of the accoutrement necessary to make it work, it all added up to $1,269. So, <laughs> so you can see that that $1,468 is really, really not gone very far beyond just paying off what it costs for us to, and, and I say us because Joe Joe and I both paid for me to start this channel. He's been really supportive. But you can see that my YouTube channel basically only just paid itself off. So if you subtract the amount that we had to invest to start the channel from the total of my AdSense revenue, then the actual profit that I've made since the channel paid off its startup costs is $199. And if you divide that out over the 1,015 hours that I worked, then my net pay has actually been 19 cents an hour for the year. Now, it will obviously look up next year, it will get better because now that the channel has paid itself off, everything that I make in AdSense is income, but it's not going to go up to more than a dollar or two an hour for quite a while yet. And again, it depends on the video, the nature of the video, the timing. It depends on all these factors over which I have no control and and I actually don't really have all that much understanding about it. I do know some, I've done some research, but it would be too much for me to try to account for that and worry about it. And I definitely don't want the knowledge of that to affect my content or to influence the way that I run my channel. So I'm just chugging along, continuing to post at least two videos per week on my own schedule for my own reasons with my own content. But I thought it made sense to share some of these numbers with you guys, just to demystify it a little bit. And also, I don't know, I feel like from the other side, YouTube can sometimes seem kind of glamorous. And it is very exciting and in many ways very fulfilling. But it isn't really glamorous in terms of pay. Like, it just doesn't pay well. And I was adding up all of the numbers of the year and my no buy and my no buy on YouTube, and it seemed like it made sense to add that in. It's a passion project, and I'm actually very, very lucky. I feel very, very lucky that my channel paid itself off this year. I, I think that's actually probably rather unusual, and I'm very surprised that it happened. I, I thought I was going to be well into 2019 before my channel managed to pay off its own startup costs. So make what you will of all of that. Um, and if you have questions about that, please feel free to ask me down below. Speaking of YouTube, I can't help but close out the video by reporting that as of this filming, I have eight 
1,428 wonderful subscribers, which is really exciting. All I want for Christmas is 9,000 subscribers. And I wrote down the number of subscribers who have emailed me, over 50. Over 50 of you guys have reached out with beautiful, sweet messages to me over the course of this year. I went through my inbox counting and I got to 50 and I was like, I'm just going to say over 50 because, you know, it was taking time to go back and go through and that's already an amazing number to me. You guys are so wonderful. And some of you I think I still have to respond to, but don't worry, I will get to your emails. It's just been such a busy time. Number of subscribers I've met in person, one. The wonderful Jennifer it was so lovely. Number of subscribers who have sent me mail of some kind, actual snail mail in the mail. I counted it up in my head and I counted the notes here on my mirror and I got to 10, but I think it might actually be 11 or 12. So at least 10 subscribers have sent me something in the mail, which is really special. And then the number of other YouTubers that I have actually gotten to know, whose channels I watch and with whom I have messaged and chatted in some way, collaborated with, I off the top of my head started adding them up and I I was able to think of more than 20 new friends who are also on this platform and I always used to be a little weirded out when youtubers would say my friend so and so and what they would mean was other people on YouTube who they'd actually never met in real life but at this point I can't think of those beautiful people in any other way they are friendships and they are friends and that has all, all of it, all of you, all 8,428 of you, all of you who have emailed me, all of you who have sent things to me, and all of you who are other content creators with whom I have been able to talk, all of that is completely priceless. Those are numbers that are so much more than the sum of their parts. And in spite of the shock of learning that I've been paid 19 cents an hour for a job that I poured over a thousand hours of work into this year, it has all been worth it and worth it and worth it a bunch of times over because of those people the people that those numbers represent. The no buy year has changed my life to the tune of thousands of dollars and a lot of space in my house that I'm able to account for by the numbers. But being on YouTube and bringing my no buy year to YouTube has changed my life to the tune of thousands of people who I've been able to connect to. And that is something that you absolutely can't put a, a sticker price on or a, a number on. You really can't. It's It's been overwhelmingly wonderful. I wouldn't have it any other way. I would go back and do it all in a second and I will continue to do it into next year and hopefully beyond. That is it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope my math was okay. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope that you will remember to take extra good care of yourself this week so that you can be the most effective version of yourself as you do your work in the world.